Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Jason Burrows. I've probably met most of you. Most of you are familiar. Uh, our first session for today. Everybody's awake. Um, <clears throat> so our talk today is about my business, Diesel Green Fuels. I have Caleb Daniels here who works with me too. It's uh, based in Austin, Texas, and on the map it looks great, but the title is Six Years of Greased Biodiesel in Texas. Um, and this is an awesome picture that, I think Caleb, you took the picture? That's one of our customers who's kind of wrangling a tank uh, into position at one of our partners where um, they, they're a fleet customer, and uh, hopefully someday we'll be a retail customer, a retail partner. Um, you want to go to the next one? That's how many bodies on Texas. Is that, is that his P-E-E -E there in Texas? You know, back here, excuse me, back here yeah, with, this, turn the with this music <laughs> going, I can't hear you. Jonathan's okay. looking to right now. Okay. It's swinging, but the it's soft not soft jazz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we've got, now we're down to less than an hour. Um, hopefully we'll stretch it out a little bit. If you have questions, I can talk about this stuff all day long. I usually do. Um, so, Interrupt me, ask questions. If it's going to come later, I'll just tell you it's going to come later. Um, it's pretty open source here. I mean, I don't know if I have any competitors in the room, but um, if I do, you know, it's okay. It's not all of our secrets, but most. Um, so these are the basics about the business. We started it back in uh, 2005. Um, the initial funding was just on a credit card. I mean, uh, had a couple partners back then. We bought everything used. And uh, today we collect 50,000 gallons of oil and sell about 50,000 gallons of biodiesel. That's just a nutshell. So, who am I? Um, I kind of do a lot of things. I'm a really busy guy. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes too busy to do the things I really like to do, like travel and things I used to do before biodiesel. Um, but uh, I'm the owner of the business. Uh, I co-founded it, and then the other two are gone. Um, I'm also on the board of a couple of uh, nonprofits, the Biodiesel Coalition of Texas, which is a lobbying organization put together to lobby um, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality because uh, they were going to ban biodiesel. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it's a little bit inactive now, but I hope that eventually there'll be a little bit more activity. Uh, I'm also on the board, uh, this is kind of a new thing, the Northwest Biodiesel Network in the Seattle area. Uh, I'm not really doing anything there yet either, but. Uh, I'm one of those two boards, so hopefully there'll be more to come there. Um, my day job that pays the bills is I'm uh, considered an architect in the data storage <coughs> networking industry. So I've worked for Dell and other large companies like EMC, if anybody's ever heard of them, the largest company in the world that sells storage. Um, <coughs> and right now I work at a, a bar, which is a reseller in Seattle. So I uh, give presentations to customers about storage and uh, whenever. Every time I get a chance, um, when I connect with those people on my LinkedIn profile, they're seeing my biodiesel business and they're always coming up to me afterward and asking about it. So I'm always spreading that message too. Okay. Um, so we collect oil from 200 restaurants. We take it to Pacific Biodiesel, uh, Texas, which is their operation there. Louder? Yeah, yeah. louder. Louder. Oh, yeah, no problem. Talk okay. to the back of the room. Um, <laughs> so we so get on the cameras. So we get the oh, for the camera too. Okay. So uh, we collect oil, we, we sell the oil, we go back to the same company and we buy the biodiesel from them. Uh, it's not exactly a tolling relationship, it's something we've done in the past, but that's not how we're doing it today. Um, we then take that biodiesel to uh, retail outlets where it's sold as B100. Uh, we have one or two customers that might do B20, uh, but generally we're a B100 company. Um, and then some other random projects we have. Um, we built a subscription-based grease customer uh, collection tool. CRM is a customer, customer relationship management tool. So it's a piece of web-based software called Biodiesel Control Center. It's how we run our business. And uh, there's about probably a handful of people here who might be using it. Uh, and then we have one actual real customer to work. So, uh, we also do some procuring of feedstock and waste material. Um, we've moved uh, a lot of different things over the years. People call us because our name's out there and say, I've got some product in Houston and I want to sell it. And so I've done some of that too. Um, also, um, I have a 2011 BMW 335D that I bought specifically to run B100 in. Right now we're at B20 and it's on the second tank and it's working fine, but 
We're doing oil sampling with Dr. Dan, and uh, we we'll hope to see if there's uh, engine oil pollution. And then also have a 2008 Jeep Grand Cherokee diesel, same kind of idea. Um, then the specialty chemical markers markets, uh, I like to say friends in low places, because it's people that are out there in the fracking industry and the oil wells and all these things out in Texas. Um, they've got, they know everybody in Texas, so there's always people looking for something and you can fulfill some of those needs with bio-based products. And so even though, you know, we all hate the petrochemical industry, we're there, you know, we can display some of what they do, uh, like fracking fluid's a good example. You know, if there's ways you could take bio-based materials for fracking fluid, uh, to displace the really nasty stuff they have, that may be a better option. That's not anything I'm actually directly involved with, but it's just an example. <clears throat> okay. um, I'll go through some of these pretty quick. Um, we, we started out as a nonprofit in 2005. Uh, we have a lot of trouble working with vendors and suppliers as a nonprofit. It's like buying and reselling things when we would try to figure out what our markup's supposed to be. Um, we just couldn't really make it work. Uh, we came to the first CBC in 2006, and uh, we heard that similar story from so many people, with some notable exceptions like Piedmont. Um, but so many co-ops and small people, small little groups, weren't having a lot of success in their models. We decided to change to a regular business, so we formed that in 2006. Um, this is where we started. This was a junkyard out in. Uh, outside of Austin, and this is our first sort of homebrew setup. Um, and I like to say the only thing I got that good that came out of that was our dog, Toby. Uh, he was a little chihuahua that was running around there at the junkyard, so we took him home. I uh, actually bought him from the kid that lived there at the junkyard, and uh, he's been with us ever since. So um, After that, we uh, graduated up into a mini storage lot, where um, we bought our first truck, uh, we were hauling things in totes, uh, doing conversions. That truck in there is a conversion that we were doing for vegetable oil, which we don't do anymore. Um, we had a really old tank we bought on Craigslist for a couple hundred bucks. Uh, our neighbor was a welder, so there was always the fear of these sparks flying over to where we were. We knew it was short term, but that was our first sort of official launch. Um, no, so we got up probably a little too big. Um, late 2008, early 2009, like so many businesses, we were affected by the economy. And at that time, we had scaled up a little bit, had a 10,000 gallon tank for biodiesel, 5,000 gallon tank for oil, 500 gallon sucker tank for collection. We had a delivery trailer, we had another tank in the back, we had toads, we had a warehouse, we had an office. Um, we had about six people running the business. Uh, salesperson to get new accounts, a couple of mechanics doing conversions. Uh, we had a couple of, uh, another driver, uh, somebody answering the phones. So we'd, we'd started to go on that track and things were going pretty well until right about the crash. Um, price of used cooking oil took a deep dive, not just at the commodity level, but the people we were selling to went away and we had to find another buyer that only paid us about a buck a gallon, which is pretty bad. Um, so this is how we run our business today. We have uh, a vacuum truck and a fuel truck. <coughs> 2,000 gallons each and uh, it works really well for us. And then we just added this, um, it's a 97 Dodge with a flatbed. So that should help us with uh, pulling the smaller loads and we have a 500 gallon uh, sucker or uh, vacuum tank that uh, we can use for the smaller routes or for uh, moving material. Um, so for me, it's really all about the people and that's been the hardest part for me, I would say, uh, getting the right people. Uh, we cycled through drivers that weren't qualified. We had people come and say they go get accounts for us for, for Greece. Um, got very little or none. Um, that's been the, the biggest struggle. Um, also, I've spent many, many hours reaching out to people around the city of Austin and just not really, in the early years, I wasn't able to make the connections that I needed. But uh, that's really where it's at, is you get the right people, get partnerships with other organizations. That's where the power is. So, um, so the people that we have working for us today, uh, Caleb Daniels, who's here today, he's my operations manager, and he really runs the day-to-day -day operations for the business. Uh, he makes the day-to-day -day decisions that come up, uh, consults with me as needed, and, and kind of takes care of business. Uh, since we've hired him, our biodiesel sales are up 88% year-over-year from last year. 
So he's been great to go out and talk to people about biodiesel, get new fleet customers, uh, maintain the relationships with our existing customer base better so they know more about biodiesel and they're, we're, we're doing things better as a result. So thank you, Caleb. Um, we actually just hired someone to be a food service account manager to go out and get new accounts and maintain the accounts that we have uh, on the restaurant side. You know, those two roles are pretty different and so it's, it's best to separate those if possible. Uh, we really have two businesses, and I don't think there's a great slide that shows this, um, but we go collect vegetable oil and then we sell it. And all the revenue that, that comes in from selling that vegetable oil, it's ours, it's locked in. Then we go buy biodiesel and then we resell that for a margin. So then, then there's that revenue stream. So at first it sounds like we're taking this money from oil and then buying biodiesel and the margin is just in the biodiesel, but it's really two businesses. Um, and, and we'll go into that a little bit more as we talk about what I'd like to do in the future. Um, we also have a few part-time people. We have a driver, uh, administrative person that helps answer the phone and, and check the mail and do deposits, <coughs> an accounting person that pays the bills, and then myself. Um, as most of you know, I moved to Seattle from Austin a couple of years ago for my day job, and I'm working sometimes at night, sometimes early in the mornings, and uh, weekends and things like that. There's a great shot of uh, Caleb out at Willie's place um, delivering fuel just last week, right? Yeah. yeah. Three days ago. Yeah. Okay. So, um, partnerships. You know, partnership is a word that I feel is probably overused in the business world. Um, businesses, I feel like, to, prom to say what they're doing is more than it really is, <coughs> they like to say they're in partnership with the people they sell things to. Um, so I try to limit this to the companies that we actually have a relationship with beyond just selling them a widget. Uh, Pacific Biodiesel obviously is a big one. Um, you know, there goes our oil, here comes our biodiesel. EcoWise is Austin's longest time eco store. Uh, they've been around for 20 or 30 years. And uh, they sell recycled flooring and uh, fair trade goods. And they've had a biodiesel tank outside for probably seven or eight years. Since, since before we were around with that. Um, we have a mechanic who is one of the co-founders of Austin Biofuels, the company that came before. Um, he now sells our fuel, which is kind of cool. Um, Green Spot Market is, this is uh, Dallas's only B100 station. It's been there for several years, and the previous company that was servicing them is gone. And so we're just now about to establish a retail presence in Dallas, which is a really big deal for us. Uh, we hope to grow uh, other things now, too. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Real L Brewing, but it's a uh, Texas-based uh, beer company. And uh, they're about, it's about an hour away from Austin. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're in a little small town called Blanco. And they're going to be selling our fuel at their um, tours every week. And they used to do that years ago, and, and now we're getting them back into that. Um, we have a web developing company that manages our website, and they do the updates to our biodiesel control center. So each of these are relationships that didn't just happen on their own, but every one of them has their own story. And you know, I feel it's very important to go out and build those relationships. And a couple of these fell in our lap, I'll admit that, but most of it are things we really worked hard for. So you know, you really have to get out there and network. Moxie Mexi, that's my wife, uh, Raquel. She does our graphic design stuff. What's the ecology action? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped that, thank you. Ecology Action is huge. That, that's actually a really, really big deal for us. That's one of the things I'm most excited about this year. Um, Ecology Action is a nonprofit company that has an old gas station that they converted into a, a, a recycling center. So uh, 24 hours a day, you can drop off recyclable materials, even I think styrofoam, like all kinds of stuff you can recycle there, and you can just drop it off. Um, for years, I tried to get in touch with them in a way where I could build a relationship so that they would pick up, they would accept used cooking oil. I could never get the right person on the phone, I stopped by a couple times, I emailed, I could just never really get it together. Um, so Caleb's made that happen. He's, he has a relationship with uh, a few of those people and we now have um, their fleet customer. That was the other thing. They have the same truck, exact same truck we had at the time and they had been buying biodiesel from EcoWise uh, inconsistently. They were only buying it when the price was lower, which doesn't make any sense for a recycling company. Um, and they also had some uh, some WBO users. So uh, now they're a fleet customer with our station, uh, which is another good story of its own omission. We had an old customer that was kind of a bad customer, long story, 
um, they donated the old stations that we sold them years earlier uh, to Ecology Action because they're a nonprofit. They hadn't been used in so long. We paid to have the tanks professionally cleaned, and so we were able to get one of those two tanks. And the nonprofit has the other one, and so now they've got a fleet station. And we recently set them up with a, uh, um, a grease collection tank, so now residents in Austin can drop off their grease here. It's something we're kind of working on a press release, and we've got a couple of statements, excuse me, from the city about it. So we're kind of putting that together in a package and kind of announcing. So we're super excited about Ecology Action. And we're renting property from them to store everything else we have, too. So we just moved into their property as well. And we're just paying with biodiesel. Oh, yeah, great point. Paying with biodiesel. Um, fleet customers. I know some people are interested in what kind of fleet customers do people have. That's something I'm always interested in. Um, how do you get a customer? How do you retain them? But, uh, what kind of people are using biodiesel? We have two landscaping companies. Uh, one landscaping company has uh, two locations, so we sell them pretty good fuel. Uh, we have a generator rental company. Uh, they've used B100 for years, and then just for some internal reason in their company, they've switched to B20. Um, but their equipment has always worked just fine with B100. And there's a well-known country music singer. Um, we sell you know, them a lot of fuel. Uh, we have uh, two recycling companies. This is Jason. Yes. Do you, do you want questions and discussion? Absolutely. Yes. I, I've got a Please. question about about generators. Yes. We we hear um, a criticism about generators. You know that they, they sit there and the fuel ages. Mm -hmm. People don't want to put biodiesel in them for that reason. It, in my previous career in the drinking water industry, we worked with drinking water plants that had generators for standby emergency power, and we always encourage them to to contract with somebody that would maintain the generator and change out the fuel. You know, regardless if they used it, mm -hmm. pump it out, sell that fuel in the market that's going to be used, and put fresh fuel in. And I'm kind of dismayed to find that that's not common practice. Have you heard mm -hmm. of any well, services like that? Or uh, I'll tell you first that because it's a rental company, that we avoid the problem of long-term storage. Um, I talk because my job is in the IT industry. I work with data centers and things like that. Um, and data centers have generators. And the last company I worked for, I was an end user, and we had a generator. And it, the, the week before I got there, we had a fire. And the whole building was running on generator power for weeks. And I kept seeing these big trucks come in with diesel, uh, you know, filling it up. And I said, why aren't we using biodiesel? How can we? And I talked to the generator company. They're like, no, we don't really know anything about it. Uh, but I heard that it takes, you can't store it very long, which is, which is true. Um, to your other point, I haven't heard of services that would swap out fuel. Uh, but sort of anecdotally, just last night, Caleb and I were talking about um, during a big festival, there are so many generators rented that are running for days at a time that the generator companies, they don't even like to go out and refill the fuel in the generators because it's that much work. So if it's a bunch of small generators, I imagine it's a lot of work to pull that fuel out and put new, new fuel in it. But maybe if you had one big one with a tank that's sort of like a heat, eating oil tank, it might not be too bad. I have heard, you know, in <coughs> hospitals, for instance, that, that they're not interested in pumping the fuel out and that's what they would just as soon burn the fuel out of it. And, and maybe that's not a bad practice to exercise the generators as well, too. So these yeah. rental generators, they're <coughs> short-term use, so they're not right. sitting with the same fuel. Right. They're movie studios, they're um, festivals, they're uh, music events and things like that. So there may be a, a service that needs to be provided for you know, somebody developed a business to contract and, and go switch out this fuel and maintain fuel in generators so we can use more batteries. That's true, because last night what we were talking about is uh, why don't we just go out there and refill these stations uh, or these generators that are out there at this festival and then charge a, charge a fee for that? I mean, they, they generate both. Uh, we just did that a month ago for the first time. Oh, really? And they liked it so much, they said they're going to get us for every festival that we do. Huh. Nobody wants to do it. Yeah. They, they actually called me on a Friday night saying, we're about to run out of fuel. And if you don't show up, we're actually going to not have any power. So I said, we'd rather just hire you guys to do this every single time. Come to the festival, hang out. Once a day, go check on everything. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's a very <coughs> viable, very viable thing to do. Dara, do you know like who, like any of the generator companies down in Denver? Because I don't know from personal experience, um, but just anecdotally, I mean, I can't think of the last time I've been to a festival or event where a generator wasn't powered on at least some blend of biodiesel. Like you can smell it. I mean, if they're always they're always biodiesel down. In our area, it seems. We're just working with these. It might be V20, though. You know, I, I don't know yeah. if it's V100. They're all about V100 in the summer. Yeah. 
you know, they put on like Sonic Bloom, yeah. and, uh, that Yarmany grass. And right. The problem with some of the festivals, though, we've, we've tried to work with them too. And a lot of times, even if they're for profit festivals, they don't pay for it. They want everything donated. So they, they'd love you to be involved if you donate. Oh, uh, yeah. Those days are over. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, speaking of donating, the reason I say those days are over sold a pretty good amount of, of filtered vegetable oil because we had a, we had a great setup to filter the water. Um, this is a biodiesel conference, I won't go too deep into it, but I'm not really a, uh, I don't really support WBO uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the IRS and EPA are not in sync in the rules. The IRS will let you pay taxes if you drive on WBO, even though it's a fuel that's not recognized by the EPA. So you can get in a situation where as a business, um, you know, you're telling the IRS, I've driven on these many gallons of this alternative fuel, um, but the EPA, it's a violation of the Clean Air Act to drive on a fuel that is not certified as having been tested for health effects. So, you know, with biodiesel, uh, they pumped all the stuff to the mice and the mice lived, so we know biodiesel is safe. That hasn't been done with vegetable oil. Uh, the general consensus is that it's probably fine, and there was some testing done by Plant Drive at an EPA facility in New Mexico in 2007. Um, but one topic that's come up is acrolein, which is part of, I guess, from burning glycerin. There may be some acrolein in vegetable oil that's released that uh, the EPA doesn't test for because it's not in general purpose fuel. Um, the EPA came to our facility and asked for a name and address and phone number of every person we ever sold a kit to. Um, they did that when they did a, uh, a check of our biodiesel to make sure we weren't making and selling our own fuel because uh, one of our competitors turned us in and, and told the EPA that we were doing that, which, which wasn't true. Um, the contractor from EPA, uh, I didn't even talk to him because it wasn't someone from EPA, but uh, they put me on the phone with the person with the EPA, and I said, you know, how do I find this information out? Freedom of Information Act, well, you know, we talked about it and we found out who it was. Um, so, as a business owner, I want to come to a conference like this and say, this is what we're doing. I don't want to say um, you could do this, but you know it's sort of under the table and all that. Um, I, I feel like I'm so proud of what I'm doing, and I've spent six years working so hard. When I tell my friends and family and things like that what I'm doing, the last thing I ever want them to hear is read about a news story of somebody who was arrested for something, and then worry about me. Oh, Jason's mixed up in all that crap. Um, so you know, WBO, it was fun while it lasted. See you later. Uh, there's also no RIN, and so if you take a gallon of vegetable oil and you think about how much money is in this, this gallon of vegetable oil, you can make biodiesel and sell it for whatever, four bucks a gallon, get another dollar fifty a gallon for a RIN. So now you're up to like five fifty a gallon um, in, in value. If you take the RIN out of the equation, that's money that just doesn't exist. You, you've taken that money out of the market. And I think our market needs that money, and, and the industry needs it. Uh, I think the, for us to have any hope of really playing with the big guys, um, you know, homebrew and WBO is a hobby is fine, but I don't want to promote it. So I just say if you want to do WBO, it's a hobby and recognize you know, there's a lot of aspects to it. Um, <clears throat> just a little point about RENs, I guess. Uh, I know a lot of small companies are struggling with this. Um, I, I went through RENs in, in the early years of RENs and did pretty well with it. Um, most people were researching it. I was. I, I was pretty proud of that. I helped some companies sell their RENs. I actually made some money doing that, which was cool. Um, with RFS2, I, I just decided I wasn't going to get involved with it. And uh, I'd love to say I had a crystal ball and all the problems that there were going to be, but I just felt like it was too complicated and I didn't want to do it. Um, but I, I stayed on top of, of some of the, the high points. and. Uh, we wound up changing our status from a rent owner to a small blender. And, and the, the phrase that goes along with that is exempt small blender. So if, you're, if you blend less than 125,000 gallons of renewable fuel a year, you can file a form with the EPA um, so that you don't have to own RINs. Um, this, this could be a really complicated topic, mostly, mostly based on separating a RIN from a gallon of fuel. Um, there are only certain few ways that you can legally separate the RINs from fuel. So depending on where you are in the supply chain, if you do it wrong, you could be you could be in a lot of trouble. If you separate your RINs instead of retiring them, then you know the value of all those RINs you should have never had. So as a small blender, we have delegated our responsibility to our upstream provider. 
So we buy fuel without rims. They pass the value of those rims, or we certainly hope they are, uh, to us. Any questions on rims or? So wait, you get rims? You're, you're, you're not receiving rims. You don't want them. I don't want to deal with them. Yeah, now, if I, if I received fuel with rims, I could make more money because the rims are so valuable. Mm -hmm. But they're passing on, I would say, at least most of the value of the rim to me. If I'm a rim uh, owner, you have to file, a, this weird word, an attestation uh, that you have to have, uh, that's an audit process with a CPA. That costs about 5000 a year. So if you pass on a RIN that turned out to be fraudulent or invalid, then you, the person you sell it to, or you're responsible for providing another RIN to Baxter. So if you're in the middle of it and this guy says, hey, that RIN you gave me was phony or whatever, then it's going to be like, well, crap, what do I do now? I'm going to have to go back here and make them give me a RIN. What if they're not in business anymore? Um, where's the money going to come from? So to me, RINs are big money, uh, you know, more money, more problems, and that's that's right there. RINs, more RINs, more problems. I'm leaving it alone. And I think Atul is going to be talking about this in detail in his his talk. He's really up on it. He deals with it all the time as well. So people that are really interested in, in that. is he here today? Yeah. Well, okay. I, don't know if he's here I, I haven't today. met him. He lives in Seattle. I haven't met him. Yeah. Yet. So that's great. Thank you for coming. Um, you go to the next one. Um, scaling up. This is just a little note about what we've done. You know, so many people start out small and they don't necessarily think about where they're going to be or they don't have the money to get where they hope to be. Um, we've gone through, I mean, there was a point where we had spent well over $100,000 on stuff. And it was stuff that I couldn't look at and see because most of it was gone. Um, that, that was on our books for a long time. So my advice to people that are sort of starting out or scaling up is plan for a generation or two ahead and try to find a way to make it happen because the transition from A to B to C is expensive, it's wasteful, um, and in hindsight you'll say, man, I wish I just bought that back truck. So uh, sucker trailer is a good intermediate step, but pick up a truck with totes, uh, makes a mess. And one other thing I'll mention is uh, when it comes to pumps, if, you could, if there's any way you can do vacuum on day one, do vacuum on day one. Um, a trash pump will chew up the oil in the water and it'll emulsify it. It'll be very, very hard to dewater. The food gets chewed up and the food is what holds the water. So I would avoid trash pumps. Use a, uh, uh, a vacuum if you can, even if it's built into a trailer. Um, on our fuel side, we scaled up from the same pickup truck from totes uh, to a fuel truck. So, you know, if I look at the cost of these, I paid uh, 20000 for the fuel truck, uh, 15000 for the back truck. I have had a ton of expenses with the back truck because it was a, a lemon. Uh, but if I look at the two of those, those and say, what does that cost me over the past five years or whatever that I've had? I'm totally worth it. Totally worth it. And then also on the uh, grease collection side, we just placed an order with a company called Confab for uh, 50 grease bins. So it'll be the first time we have real legitimate grease bins that weren't taken from some other grease render that went out of business. and. Uh, staffing, I don't know what I was going to say there. It's good to have staff. <laughs> <laughs> we have more, more staff. staff in the year. Yes, we do. Um, some of our big challenges, um, there have been several times when people have a process about acquiring the business, um, and nothing's happened. Uh, so we've had the ban on biodiesel, we've had grease theft. Um, I had a former business partner that signed a non compete uh, but decided to go out and start help start a business used a name that was kind of fake, said it was based in Austin, but it was 150 miles away. Um, they used the state capital as their address and their Google map to get the best listing in Google. Um, they were a nightmare. And they took 20 of our accounts and over a six month period, and we didn't know it because they held on to the cancellation agreements. <coughs> so I got a stack, I got this letter in the mail, 20 cancellation notices. So I got on a plane and flew Moy out from Piedmont and the two of us spent 10 days, you know, I didn't take a week off of work, we spent 10 days going to all those restaurants and we got all of them back in one. And it was very validating that we were doing the right thing. Our story was solid. Um, I even put together this whole like dossier about, you know, this is what this is a guy's Facebook page. Notice how it says he still owns part of the business. Here's their Secretary of State filing where they use a name that doesn't match this. This person's name is here. Uh, it was a, it, it wasn't fun. <coughs> 
But when it was all done, it was a very uh, valuable experience. Um, had lawyers' fees, so you know, learning about what can you do legally? Can you get an injunction? How much does that cost? Is it worth it? Uh, what if the injunction says his non-compete could be extended for three years? So it was a real roller coaster for about a year uh, of dealing with them. Then they kind of went away after um, after we told them, no, we're can they're canceling them again and coming back to us. Um, we didn't really see them going after our accounts, but they were very successful in getting new accounts, which is what we weren't doing at all. Um, well, so about a week ago or two weeks ago, we got started getting phone calls from their customers. They're out of business. So that's a great feeling. <laughs> Um, finding good people, it's been really tough. Uh, we've had drivers that were just commercial truck drivers that said, yeah, sure, I'll do that for 10 bucks an hour. Um, we've had, you know, not many good people. So uh, now we have good people. And, and the other big challenge is just staying motivated. Um, you know, it's taken a toll on me personally, trying to, when I started this business, I was single, uh, had a girlfriend, but now we're married and have a kid, so it's a big difference having a four-year-old. <laughs> Um, staying motivated through all these experiences and um, you know you get the grease theft and then uh, we had biodiesel I didn't even mention the biodiesel theft uh, and then the, the tank that was stolen the same night as our biodiesel 330 gallons of biodiesel I wonder where that name came from inside the total um, that same night we had a, a container stolen that appeared at that company's uh, one of their customers I even had a picture of it before same scratches and everything. Showed all this stuff to the police, and, and it comes down to sorry. If I talk to them and they say that they found it on the side of the road, then that's all we can do is just take that as their word. So you know, we dealt a lot with the police. The other thing that I mentioned is about grease theft is uh, we also just got our first success story of grease theft, which is uh, a company that stole oil from us that we had witnesses was fined ten thousand dollars by the state. Uh, now that we got that happened, we're going to go. You didn't know that? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is just actually a few days ago. Uh, waste cooking oil brokers. Ooh, on camera. Uh, we have, there's this one guy in Texas that is the most notorious grease thief. Um, he uh, has worked for a number of different companies, and every company he goes to winds up being accused of grease theft. <laughs> well, the last company he worked for, all of his, all of our, uh, we have this hospital chain. Every hospital chain, their containers appeared at. So the, the person our contact at that hospital, they called the police and they called their security department. This is two months later, of course, because everything takes so long to figure this stuff out when you're only going to a restaurant every eight weeks. So they had this meeting and the guy admitted that it was a big mistake. Oops, sorry, we thought we had a contract. I guess you didn't really want to go with our services. And they picked him up. Um, that same guy starts another company and, uh, and steals our oil from, from one of our top restaurants, and uh, our customer was out there with them the whole time. Got the license plate number, hey guys, how's it going? Did all that, identified them on the lineup, and uh, yeah, $10,000 fine. So now that I have that information, I can take it back to the police and say, look, they were found responsible for this crime, now can you please go after them? Because the police didn't do anything. And then the other part of it is a civil suit. You know, I could, I could file a civil suit against them for all the oil that they took in the, in the time before that we think they took. Okay. And this, this is kind of the crazy thing about the business. This is what always gets me. How much time do you spend not doing biodiesel or not doing SVO? Just all the administration and all this troubleshooting. And, and, and it's very true. And, you know, what I always say is, um, like my stepmom, she runs a business, and her motto is do it all, keep it all. And, and she says, you know, why don't you just drive the back truck yourself? Just do it all yourself. And there's just too much work. And, and it's not collecting the oil. It's it's dealing with all the nonsense. Um, and it's not all nonsense. I mean, a lot of it's fun. But the things that you know, you have to plan in. And, and one of the things I've learned just being in IT is you can't staff one person for every role because that person goes on vacation and the system goes down. You know. So and you have to build in 20% of your time for downtime. It's all these things that you have to account for. And running a business is you know the same way, much more so than just in my day job. Um, so hopefully we're, we're better off than we were before. Caleb's not the only person doing work. We have a driver that's part-time, and we're talking about bringing another part-time driver on, uh, part-time driver and laborer. Um, so this is a little bit about our brand identity. Um, 
when I got into this business, only thing we really had was a little drawing that I made, and then my wife did it in the computer, a little flower. It's going to have a little atomic, you know, atoms going around it. Uh, that was our first logo. Um, and then we came up with this diesel green. One of the things we found is people always want to put diesel green as two different words, and that really didn't help. So we just created a new logo, the one on the bottom, which is what we're going with now. Um, our website, I did it myself, the first one, and then um, there's an open source uh, content management system that um, Alex from uh, Colorado did for me. Your, your buddy? Trujillo. Trujillo. Yeah, Trujillo. Alex Trujillo, yeah. Uh, he did that for us, which was awesome. We did it for free. Um, so we just moved to a hosted WordPress site. I don't know if you guys do websites or do anything like that. WordPress off. WordPress is awesome, and I happened to meet the founder of WordPress uh, a few weeks ago. Great guy. Um, social media and a blog, you know, getting that presence out there. If you Google for Austin Biodiesel, you'll find my blog, you'll find the Facebook page, you'll find the Twitter account, you'll find, um, you'll find a lot of stuff. And, and it's not about me. Um, so, you know, just getting your brand out there so that when one restaurant talks to somebody else, they say, oh yeah, we're using that. Uh, marketing, marketing collateral, a lot of people don't start out with that, maybe just a little slick. We, we tried to get everything. We've got a, um, a, what I call a prospectus. It's like a four or five page thing. We've got a brochure, we've got um, a whole packet of sticker, uh, it says fryer fuel uh, for the restaurants. We've got a bumper sticker, we've got the restaurant stickers, all that. It's a package. We just got about another slide or two. Um, so my long-term vision for the business is I'd like to get our footprint into Dallas, San Antonio, and Houston. Um, if you look at Texas, it's a very big state, but it's actually pretty small where all the people live. And each of those cities is maybe 150 to 200 miles apart. It's really not that big. Um, there's a great guy in Houston that's selling uh, biodiesel. He's been selling it for years and years. But in Dallas and San Antonio, San Antonio is a dense for biodiesel. Uh, vertical integration, you know, someday I'd love to be a biodiesel producer or perhaps build our own. Um, we need property. We, we're, we've been kind of uh, in a, a yard, you might say. Now we're in another yard. Uh, we don't have a real office. It's not required, but I know that it would be very useful, particularly if I get back to Austin. Um, I think that we need to get into the trap grease business so we can offer combined services, so we can offset the cost of one with the other. Uh, I think we've, got, we've lost customers to people that are doing combined services. Uh, we, we just got to get there. It's a matter of when. Uh, new back truck, we are going for a grant. Uh, we will go for a grant as soon as it's open in the next couple of months. And we might be able to get about $30,000 off a new truck. And even though a new truck may be seventy dollars to $100,000, uh, $30,000 off is a big chunk. And they come with a hundred thousand mile warranty. Uh, you know the maintenance issue. We spent fifty thousand dollars in maintenance on our back truck in the past four years. So when you look at that, fifty thousand plus the fifteen I paid for, it, I would have much rather had a sixty or seventy thousand dollar back truck that didn't have the problems in our hand. Speaking, you had mentioned earlier about motivation, and speaking of that, like, what kind of? I mean, this might be. What kind of money can you make? I mean, that's the. I mean, I, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, because sure. I get like it's much more time, it's clearly much more time than it's I'll tell you, after, worth. after all these years and all the iterations of everything else, um, if my business blew up today, like for whatever reason, or I moved to some other state or some other city or whatever, I have a skill that will last the rest of my life. I can go knock on a restaurant, I can tell them a story, and they will give me their oil. Um, we have never paid anybody for oil, uh, except for maybe like a random home brewer that's got some old oil or something like that. Um, I, we have five-year contracts with our restaurants where they give us the oil at no charge. Uh, we promote their, their restaurant, you know, website and Facebook and things like that. Um, but the quote that I like, I love it, that I got this from uh, one of our favorite restaurants, Torchy's Tacos. I called him because it was, the word was that he was going to switch to somebody else. Somebody had come along and said, we're going to pay you 50 cents a gallon. So I called him and said, the whole thing, it's all over again. Hey man, it's me. What's going on? You really thinking about switching? And he's like, he's like, look, my job is to make the best tacos in Austin. Your job is to take care of my garbage. Uh, and you know, that's what it's all about. Let them worry about their core business. Now, if it's a kind of restaurant that's going to produce a massive amount of oil, it's exceptional oil. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, two minutes. Work. Two minutes. Okay. Um, I think we're going to get there where we start paying restaurants, um, but we don't today. <laughs> so, if if I look at what kind of money can you make? Well, you can make about 250 a gallon for the oil. Uh, 
um, if you have the right partner to go to with that oil. That's the other thing is, is I've built this network where we know people in San Antonio we can take the oil to, we know people in Houston that we can take oil to, and we know people in Dallas. So if we're buying about the same amount of biodiesel as the oil that we're <coughs> producing or generating or collecting, if we take it to a renderer who's going to put it on a boat to China, well, the biodiesel producer is only buying enough oil to produce the biodiesel that, that he needs for us. So if we give him the oil, he's not buying the oil from the local renderers, and they're sending it on a boat to China. So it really doesn't matter so much if I send, sell it to a renderer over here and then buy the biodiesel from over here, especially if the spread of those two markets is, is significant, which in some cases it has been. We've been able to sell it over here for a good bit more than, than we could buy it, you know, produce it. Um, so I, I do plan to return to Austin, um, hopefully um, in the spring of 2013. <coughs> so we'll see. Um, you know, my day job is cool, but this is where my heart is, so I'll, I'll hope to do that. Uh, I'd also like to host the, this conference, um, whether it's next year or the year after. That's my, I mean, yeah, ever since I started coming, uh, I think me and, and, and Jonathan are the only two that have come every single year. Isn't that right? We talked about that last year? Unless anyone else can do that. Yeah. Just in October. Uh, <laughs> 2010 it didn't happen, but, you know, um, we were supposed to host the SBS in 2000, <coughs> when, whenever it came to San Antonio, and the people that I was working with didn't, didn't pull it together. They didn't reply to emails, and they didn't pull it together. The person who was in charge of it didn't. So it was a real disappointment. That's really exciting that um, you, you're interested. And you're you're over time, so. Okay, one more. <laughs> so just a couple random thoughts. Um, I hate B99. I think it confuses the market. I don't ever say the words B99 to my customers. When I was a customer, I found an email the other day where I emailed back in 2005. So why is it B99 instead of B100? What does that extra bit of diesel do? Customers don't care. Keep it simple. So. Um, it's B99.999 or whatever, legally it's supposed to be B99.9 because EPA says you can only go in less than one tenth of a percent or more than a tenth of a percent. So uh, if you can, just consider calling it B100 unless you really need to be specific with your supplier. Um, Biodiesel Independence Day, that's kind of me being silly, but uh, March 15, 2013, the National Biodiesel Board loses its uh, monopoly or, or lock on the Tier 1 health effects data from EPA. So after that point, anybody should be able to make biodiesel and not register with, uh, or not be a member of the MVB unless they find value in the organization. Um, my contact information, um, on Facebook, Twitter, uh, the web, LinkedIn, definitely LinkedIn. I mean, that's, that's a group that we should all be using, or, or a function we should all be using to stay in touch. That's it for me. Last question? If you're starting out, you talked about the haulers license. Yeah. Rent. Is that how you should be? If you're just beginning. Depends on your state. Your state. You can take it for personal use without a license in Texas. So I would just go with that. The very first thing you do is get your get comfortable talking to restaurants, going in, asking for their oil, telling them the story, collecting the oil, and establishing a fee basic. Mm -hmm. When you take it from there, use it yourself. If you're on diesel, if you're on vehicles. Yeah, I mean. That's really the question, is what are you trying to do? If you're trying to do it as a business, then you should get the license first. But actually, Dan Stonecipher is going to be talking about federal uh, regulatory requirements for it. The folks sort of in California, this is sort of rarefied air, but they do become a good sort of introduction to what the laws are about oil collection. Okay. Thank you, Thank you again, Jason.